All righty, so we are live for the 100th live interview with Become a Fearless Father, and it's going to be lots of fun, and I'm blessed to have Aaron Parkinson taking the time again, right, because we had to cancel one time, to come back on and set this up with me for celebrating, people, celebrating the 100th live interview that I've done in little over a year. So I'm very excited about it. And we're going to change the whole strategy and everything. So um, be aware of that from now on. Every single time, every we're going to go, I'm only going to go live once a week in regards to interviews every Thursday, 9 p.m. CET. And at the moment, I have no idea what that is for Americans. So I'm going to come back with you on that. But Aaron, thank you so much for being on and sharing this celebration interview with me. I appreciate that. Um, well, I, I, uh, I only canceled the first time because I wanted to make sure I was number 100. I didn't want to nah. be like 98 or 99, you know, so it was all strategic. Uh, very smart, very smart. Um, so what I liked, and because, um, well, um, as everybody knows, I always check out, I stalk, <laughs> I stalk the people that I interview before we start going on. And I, I saw something that I really liked. You mentioned I'm a life liver, right? And I'm just wondering, man, can you share a little bit? One on one end, what does that look like? But I think most importantly, how can others be a life liver? Well, I think first off, you need to know what the ideal life is, you know, mm -hmm. for you. And, um, and so many people, they're disappointed in you know, what their life is, you know, how things are going, what's happening to them, so on and so forth. But they never actually sat down and defined, you know, what is the ideal life? And, you know, I've always called myself a life liver because, you know, I'm in the marketing space and, and we do a lot of things where we're constantly optimizing marketing. But mm -hmm. I, I like to optimize my life as well. And, and the only way to do that is to first start with, you know, what is that life going to look like? And it's funny that you asked this because I redid it again two weeks ago. I'm actually moving to the Cayman Islands. I live on the West coast of Canada right now. I'm moving to the Cayman Islands on August 8th. And one of the reasons that I'm doing that is I'm, I'm powered by sunshine. I love the Caribbean. I don't like the rain six months a year. Yeah. And I, and I felt like my life was um, less optimized uh, being up in the West coast of Canada. And, you know, every time there's a significant change, I look back at my ideal life and I take a little time and I ask myself, what's the ideal life right now? Mm -hmm. and, and the ideal life for me right now, I just mapped it out going into, into my move is, you know, I want to get up in the morning, you know, roughly 6 a.m., get a good start, um, knock out the stuff that, that I don't really like to do, the emails and the, the answering questions with my team, you know, the, the minutia. Mm -hmm. And then I've one of the things I've uh, has been concrete for me is I've I've made my kids breakfast and I've driven them to school uh, for 15 years now. Oh. And and that gives me the the gratitude and the, you know, the, the dedicated time with them in the morning um, that really establishes the balance for me. And it, and it gets me up. It, it wakes me up. It, it forces me to have a little bit of a schedule. And uh, and so I'm going to drop them off at 815 you know, to school in the Caribbean. And then I'm going to go to my gym. Um, mm. I'm a CrossFit guy. So I, I go to my gym from nine till 10. I shower mm. up. I get to my office at about 11. And I work with my team on a live call till about noon. Mm. And then from noon till four, um, I, I'm working on strategy or calls or lead generation, the things that keep, you know, me interested, keep the pipeline full. Um, for our marketing agency. And then at four, uh, I want to be taking advantage of the beach. You know, I want to be taking advantage of the fact that I live, you know, on one of the, the, the five most beautiful beaches in the world. Mm -hmm. So my schedule says four o'clock walk beach, you know, it, it, it's scheduled so that I don't get distracted um, by the million people who want to talk to me on any given day. And five o'clock, uh, get home, uh, and six o'clock dinner with the family every night and then shut it down and leave my office, uh, leave my computer and my phone um, off until mm -hmm. the next morning, 
you know, because one of the things I saw in the last uh, last few months is, is, you know, as we became more in demand, my day was expanding mm-hmm. to, you know, starting at five and, and then ending at 10, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I could tell very quickly that I was getting out of sync with my core beliefs and my, and, and, you know, living life the way that I want to live it. So this gave me the opportunity to reset and define what the perfect life is. And, and the perfect life for me is, is a balance, you know, and I've tried to explain this to a few different people before. I believe that the ideal life is a balance of family, Mm -hmm. fitness, finance, and followers. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean followers in the sense of like how many people are on your social media, because that's irrelevant to me, (laughs) but it's followers who have influence. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for me, I can get access to almost anything I want to get done to the best talent, to the best opportunities, to the best people, because I have followers that are influential in my space. But if you let go of your family or you let go of your fitness or you let go of your finance, and I don't mean finance from the sake of money, I, the money actually comes from the followers. Mm-hmm. But what I mean is the finance is the actual planning of, you know, building the, building the life that you want, building the foundation that you want. If you've got all four of those things working in conjunction, then you're living life. If, mm-hmm. if you only have one of them or two of them, I mean, there's lots of guys with tons of money and, and they're fat and they're nearly dead. And, you know, that you can't take that money with you. That's not living life. Right. Mm-hmm. Or you've got, you know, guys that are super in shape and they've got a million followers on Instagram, but they've got no money, right? That's not living life, right? Or you've got kids who don't know their parents or they grow up with all of these problems, you know, and you get to the end of life and you go, oh yeah, I won, you know, I'm important, I'm influential, I've got money. And and the kids will say to you, yeah, but you never spent any time with me, I don't even know you. In fact, I hate you, mm-hmm. right? And so you've got to have that balance and, and that balance also sets the tone and the precedent for my kids so that when they're looking at who do I want to be when I grow up, they understand that they have to have balance in those four areas if they want to be truly happy. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. Yep. Um, I want to show you my coffee mug. My wife bought me this coffee mug. Can you read it? Dear husband. Thanks for being my husband. If I had a different husband, I would punch him in the face and go find you. Oh, love <laughs> all right. fair enough. <laughs> Good thing she's with you. If not, there would be somebody walking around with a black eye right now. Right. right. <laughs> and and you and I have both spent a little time in the ring, so so she's uh, she's got some tricks in her bag. Oh, snap. <laughs> um. Man, I like that explanation. I think it's so important because when you started out, what what always comes in my head, and not because it's me, but just because I know where I've been when I started out and when I listened to guys like you, uh, I'd be like, yeah, but it's easy for Aaron to say. Like he got a successful business, so, you know, he's making lots of money so he can, you know, make his life the way he wants it. Now I know better. (laughs) But that's, that's, I know for a fact there's so many dappers out there that are just starting out that immediately get that in their heads, right? How do you make sure, and, and I apologize, we'll go into your origin story in a second, but how do you make sure that, that that kind of mindset in the beginning, because I'm sure I'm going to assume that you had similar thoughts as well in the beginning where you saw great guys, oh, we got a name, Russell Brunson, uh, Dean Graciosi, and Tony Robbins. I named those three because they keep popping up my Facebook. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're really good at, their, at building their followers, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. Since we're talking about followers, right? Mm -hmm. So how did you, because I think that's, even though, yes, you're right, you got to step one is, you know, what's your ideal life? But I think that comes a step before that, like, okay, how do I build my mindset so I can actually make that step to build uh, or or to start writing out what's my ideal life? How did you, what, what are your tips and tricks in regards to creating that mindset? Um, I, I think the first thing is just giving yourself, um, giving yourself the freedom and, and, and almost, um, 
forgiving yourself for what the beginning will look like, mm. you know, because I started my first business, not because I wanted to become rich and famous. I started my first business because I wanted to be at home with my kids and raise my kids the way that I wanted to raise them. And in the beginning, it's counterintuitive because in order to be able to do that, you have to sacrifice in a lot of other areas, which can actually negatively affect the goal that you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. And so, you know, if you're going to try to become an entrepreneur, and especially if you're a dad, what's probably going to end up happening is um, you're working, you know, your wife is working, um, your, you know, your kids are busy, they need a lot of attention, and you need to basically go from your first job to coming home to having dinner with your family, you know, trying to get a solid maybe hour of, you know, hour to two hours of personal time with them to connect. And then you've got to go shut yourself in a, in a hole in your office, mm -hmm. you know, from eight o'clock at night until one o'clock in the morning. And it's counterintuitive to, to what you're trying to accomplish because mm -hmm. you're, you're doing it because you want to be a dad, but now you feel like you're being less of a dad in, in, in the beginning to try to accomplish your goal. And, and you have to give yourself permission to say, hey, this is a, a short-term sacrifice for a long-term gain. I've worked from home now for 15 years. Mm -hmm. I've raised my children the way I wanted to. Um, they, My wife wrote a book um, called How to Raise Great Kids in a Generation of Assholes. It's on Amazon. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and she writes about all the things that we've gone through and we've done with our kids. And, but those first, like that first year, that first really year to two years was really, really stressful for me because I wasn't spending as much time as I wanted with them in an effort to be able to spend more time with them. So I think you have to give yourself permission to be a worse dad for one year so you can be an amazing dad for a decade. Mm -hmm. You know, and you have to communicate that like that's I said that to my wife when I started, I said, look, like I I'm not going to have a lot of time. The time that I do have, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be present. I'm going to be focused. But if you want the same, if we want the same thing, you need to to help support me to to get this off the ground because it's not going to be easy. It's never easy. Mm -hmm. and, and we agreed that this is what we wanted. We were on the same page and, and um, we've always been very open in our communication with our kids about, you know, how business works and life works and challenges come and opportunities come and, you know, the difference between people who just get by and the difference between people who excel and, and their, their mindsets. And so they always know what's going on. There's nothing hidden from them. Mm -hmm. It's a very open communication, you know, how, so I think it's that combination of, of communication and getting everybody's buy-in and also giving yourself permission to be a, a worse dad for one year to be a great dad for a decade. Exactly, exactly. Yep, that was a, an awesome share. I don't know if people start noticing, but the letter F seems to be Aaron's favorite letter. Um, <laughs> and I like that because fearless father is also, um, Fearless is an F and fathers are also an F. So for me, it's perfect. <laughs> Keep going with the Fs. For those people that are listening, because um, for some people, it's four, right? Four areas, as you mentioned. Um, you, you said family, finances, followers, and uh, fitness, right? Yeah. And for those that are listening, there's also fifth, if you feel like it. And that can be also the F, which is faith, right? Very I sure actually bring that up. A, a lot of time in my speeches, I say, you know, for those of you who, you know, believe then faith is a big part of it. And faith was a huge, huge part of it um, mm -hmm. for me. Um, but it doesn't resonate with everybody. Exactly. Well, well in this show, you can um, share what um, it's you. So I want you to share uh, what's important for you and everybody can learn. Um, me, myself, I'm not religious, but I have faith. Yeah, I, I, I would, I would, I would classify myself as the same way, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, faith, faith is the belief in things unseen, right? You have to have a lot of faith when you're getting started that mm. it's going to work out. And a lot of the times you've got to borrow your faith from other people. In fact, almost, uh, almost 90% of it is borrowing faith from other people, which is why you, 
have to put yourself into that environment mm -hmm. every single day and look for those examples of people that have been successful in your space and, and constantly surround yourself with their teachings, with their environments, with their testimonials, because in the beginning, when you've got nothing, your, 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 your belief gets eroded very, very quickly and your outside circumstances and the people that don't believe in you is a, is a constant erosion of your belief. Mm -hmm. And, and that belief has to stay at, a, yeah. at a, an extremely high level because life is hard. Like, you know, I, I don't want to spoil the end of the movie for everybody, but you're going to fail a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and if anything, you should try to fail as fast as you can so that you can learn quickly and move on. If you're afraid of failing, I hate to ruin it for you. You're, you're, you're not going to make it like you have to embrace the failure as quickly as possible and know it's coming. It's not just coming. It's a necessity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. More F's. <laughs> failure. Maybe we should add that in failure. Faith and failure will be added to it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, man, I appreciate that. That's why just for the people to know, that's actually been one of the biggest advantages of now having done a hundred live interviews is having the possibility to talk to guys like you that are further ahead than what I am right now. But that, that just bring that faith is like, look where Aaron's at. And now he's going to the Cayman Islands. That's, well, I don't want to go to the Cayman Islands, but I have some similar visions, right? I want to move to, and it's like, ah, yes. And it, it inspires you and it bring, gives you faith. Like, okay, yeah, see, Aaron can do it. I can do it, right? Absolutely. So, and, and I do the same things for myself. You know, I, mm -hmm. I have friends who are, you know, billionaires and, you know, I'll get on their planes and just fly with them, not because I want to go where they're going, mm -hmm. just because I want to be in that environment of like, here's the next level. Um, here's what this op op offers to me. But I also want to, I want to warn people that what you want is not necessarily what everybody else wants. Like your view mm -hmm. of, of success is not, it's, it's, it's not just this linear thing where like, you know, you're this level and you're this level. And if you're not at this level, you're not successful. You know, you're successful if you're happy, mm -hmm. right? Because I know lots of people with lots of money who aren't happy, right? Mm -hmm. I could make more money. I've made a lot of decisions over the last 15 years that have cost me a lot of money. Mm -hmm. and, and an example of that would be my, you know, 10 years ago, my partner wanted me to move to New York City because that's where our office was based and that's where our staff was. Mm -hmm. And he said, we would be so much more successful if you were in the office every single day. And I don't disagree with him. I think he was right. Mm -hmm. um, but I lived on a mountain in the West Coast of Canada with fresh air and trees and low crime and low drama. And that's where I wanted to raise my family. Mm -hmm. So was I successful in that venture? Yes. Was I as financially successful as I could have been? No. But that's because I looked at the core beliefs that I had and I and I decided to make, you know, a decision that fit within my core beliefs, not necessarily with what everybody viewed as success. Mm -hmm. So if success is, is, is happiness to you, as long as you've got those four things in place, you're going to have a pretty stable foundation, those four or five. Exactly. exactly. Great. All right. So let's... <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more about you, Aaron, but more in the sense of let's go into your orange story. And what I always uh, like to share or the, uh, I would like you to share is what's your family set up, um, how long you've been married and how many kids you have, how and what age they have. So people can get a better understanding of you know, um, where you at within the dadpreneur. Sure. Yeah. Um, I've been married almost 20 years. Um, I'm 42 now. Uh, I have an eight-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 15-year-old. Um, the two younger ones are my boys. The oldest one is my daughter. And, um, you know, the, my daughter, I think this is common with a lot of people, the first child, um, she changed. You know, it, seems, it sounds so cliche when people say it. Like, she changed everything, right? But she changed everything. Mm -hmm. It's just a fact, you mm -hmm. know? And, you know, back then I was you know, in my mid twenties and, um, I was trying to get into the UFC. 
um, at the time. Um, I played soccer at a national team level when I was young and I got cut because I'm a goalkeeper and I'm only five. I only end up growing to five eleven, and goalkeepers need to be about six foot four. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they said, are you going to grow anymore? And I said, probably not. And nah. they said, well, you may want to look for something else. And, and so I transitioned, I'd been doing karate since I was five and, and Muay Thai. And so I transitioned into, uh, MMA and, um, you know, I was rough around the edges, man. Like I probably drank four nights a week. Mm. Um, I smoked a pack of cigarettes a day. Um, I spent four hours a day in the gym trying to kick people upside the head. You know, I had two crappy jobs serving tables and bartending and, um, and, and we, you know, when, when we got married, you know, we ended up moving to the Cayman Islands. The first time we lived there, we went and we bartended uh, for a couple of years and um, saved a little bit of cash to buy a house. And we moved back and, and we got married and we had our first daughter. And I remember, you know, the day that, that she was born, the rain was going sideways because it was the wind was so strong that, that, that the rain was just blowing and um, my, my wife said to me, what do you want to name her? We were in the hospital. And, and I remember thinking to myself that it does not matter how awful this, this weather is today and what, what, how miserable it is. This is the best day of my life. She's like, she's like sunshine on this day. And, um, and so the French word for sunshine is soleil. Mm-hmm. And, and so I said, what if we name her soleil? And uh, my wife just said, I love it. And, and, you know, from that point forward, instantly I knew that uh, the path that I was on was not going to be the path that was going to allow me to be the father that, that I wanted to be. I didn't have a particularly great childhood. So I wanted to rectify those issues with my own kids. And I was working from... Uh, nine in the morning until five o'clock for uh, Chrysler um, for a car company, Chrysler Dodge. And then I would go from there to um, the nightclub that I worked at where I ran security for the Mm -hmm. nightclub. I was a bouncer at a nightclub and I would get home at maybe, you know, 12 or one, you know, in the morning and then just sleep until my next shift started the next day. And it got to the point where I was driving on my lunch break from from the car lot. I had a half an hour for lunch um, every day as my break. And I would drive to my house, which took 12 minutes, just so that I could hold my daughter for five minutes and then get in the car and drive back to work to make it back in time after my lunch break. Mm-hmm. You know, and and I it would just it it was this feeling inside of of it, just completely unacceptable, just maximum pain. And, and I knew I had to do something, but I didn't have any skills and I didn't have any, you know, I've always been an idea person, but I didn't know what I was supposed to do at that point to, to, to create the life that I wanted to create. And it didn't, you know, I just kept looking and looking and looking and looking. And, and ultimately um, I read a newspaper ad on my lunch break, you know, same thing on my lunch break. I was, you know, just looking for something to get out. And I ended up finding a small business opportunity ad and I got on a phone call and I ended up in a network marketing company and I didn't know anything about the network marketing world. And, um, you know, that was just, you know, seeing all these people that were having success and they were living life on their terms. I thought, Oh, you know, maybe this is what, you know, this is the solution. I don't have a lot of money. I don't have a lot of time. You know, maybe I could do this. And that first year was, was horrible. We, we, we borrowed probably about $50,000 and we had no money. Um, you know, my wife was, my wife's mother was bringing us baby formula over cause we didn't have enough, you know, to, to buy it ourselves. Mm. Um, I was working, you know, the two jobs plus, the, trying to build the network marketing company. And then my wife ended up going back to work only four weeks after having my daughter. Cause she knew that I needed the time to work on the business and only have one job, not two jobs. So there's my wife, you know, just a month after having my daughter going back to work full time, which, you know, killed me inside. Mm-hmm. And, um, it was a grind. And, and I remember 
when we finally broke through and started to make some sales, um, you know, it was December and we'd been doing it for about a, you know, about a year. And, um, I had wanted to retire my wife. I had started to make a few sales, but none of the big sales. I'd wanted to retire her by Christmas, like to get her back home with me. Mm -hmm. And, um, we just, it was like December 5th and we weren't there yet. And then instantly, you know, I made, you know, about $10,000 in commissions in a month. And it was like hitting the lottery. Mm -hmm. And I was able to say to her, you know, stupidly, I should have, you know, I thought I was rich because I had $10,000. Mm -hmm. um, but I said to her, you can quit now. And, and I drove her to the mall and I, I gave her $500. And I said, I need you to spend this on yourself. I need you to go and buy yourself something selfish, clothes, whatever you need, because I need to feel like, uh, like, like a man, like a, like a, you know, like somebody supporting this family, like mm -hmm. do this. And she didn't want to, she said, no, no, just put it in the bank, put it in the bank. And you know what she ended up buying? No. A vacuum. No. For $500? <laughs> she bought a vacuum because we had two dogs and the old vacuum was all busted up and broken. She took the first $500 in a year that she had and she bought a vacuum. And, uh, and it's, it's always been this ongoing joke. And, uh, and we kept building on the business, um, had another breakthrough the, na the next month, um, did about $50,000 in commissions this, the next month. And now I really thought mm -hmm. I was rich and um, continued to, to work with that company for about another year after that. And, and um, from there, I ended up building really one of the first um, marketing platforms for all network marketing companies. Um, to be able to teach their distributors how to market online. So we provided all the websites, all the, the, the emails, the sales team, the, mm. the training. Russell Brunson, I think, was actually an affiliate of ours, like back like before he became Russell Brunson. Uh -huh. and, um, and, and that's when things really started to take off because I had time, we were traveling, you know, I had, I had fine and my finances were in order. You know, I was able to get back to the gym more often. I had a lot of followers, you know, my family was very tight. Um, but that, that year from where we made the decision that I had to do something to, to, to get my time back mm -hmm. to actually getting my time back most people wouldn't have suffered through that. They wouldn't have suffered through the fear of the debt. They wouldn't have suffered through the work. They wouldn't have suffered through the lack of sleep. They wouldn't have suffered through the strain in their relationship. You know, not that there was strain. It's just, it's, you both want to spend more time together and you don't have the time, right? Um, but that, that commitment, that sacrifice that we made for that one year set us up, mm -hmm. you know, for the next 14 after that. Exactly, exactly. For the people that want to check out Aaron, uh, I'll put the website real quick in the comments section. You can click on the link and go right to the website. Uh, you can do two things at the same time and listen and check it out. So um, always trying to be as efficient as possible. Anyway, check that out. I will show it again at the end. And um, Aaron will then also probably share other areas where you can follow him, get in touch with him, et cetera, et cetera. I'm on all the, I'm on all the usual spots. I don't need to list them all. You you can find me wherever 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 normal people are. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So um, we share tons already, but I'm very interested in this, and I think I saw it on your uh, on your website that um, one of the things that you do is help uh, entrepreneurs dominate their industry, right? A niche. Yeah. A niche or do you say industry? Okay, I think. Uh, niche or industry, they're interchangeable. Exactly. Doesn't matter, right? So share a little bit more. What, what are some tips and tricks? Tricks, sorry, tip. <laughs> tip and tricks for those dappers out there that are listening now or later listening and watching to the to the replay to dominate their industry. I, I think first and foremost, you have to be in an industry that that you really love, you know, too many people are looking for the industry where they can make money. Mm -hmm. um, they're not looking for the thing that, that they love. And uh, I, I had this conversation with one of my clients the other day. He, I'm not in the network marketing industry anymore. I haven't been for 
quite some time now, but he has a, a company that coaches network marketers. Yeah. And um, he, he was say, asking me the same thing. Like, how, how do I, how do I create custom training for custom products for these people and what they want to sell? And, and I said to him, everybody kind of gravitates towards, you know, a story that somebody has sold them about. This is the way, this is the best way to go make money. And I, I will challenge that. They are all hard. There is no, there's no easy one. So you have to find that industry where you're genuinely interested in it mm -hmm. and you have a passion around it because your primary source, your primary resource to draw from is your own energy, especially in the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you like doing podcasts, you know, there's, there's lots of examples of people who make lots of money with podcasts, right? You want to be following those people and modeling the things that they're doing and putting your own spin on it. You don't want to be going into the health supplement world because somebody told you you can make lots of money in the health supplement world. Well, they're right. You can, but there's just as many failures in the health supplement world as every other thing out there. There's, there's the same percentages of successful people in mm -hmm. each industry. You know, you have your, your medium successful people are about 15%. Your really successful people are 10%. And then everybody else is just filling space, you know, and, and doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. It, first and foremost, you got to choose something that you're, that you can get energized by every morning because the passion is already built into the fiber of your being. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the first thing that I would say to people is, is choose the direction no matter how crazy it might be, because there's some crazy niches out there where people have made money. You know, one of our first success stories was a 14 year old girl who made hamster beds. You know what hamsters are, right? Yeah. yeah she made hamster yeah. beds. And I remember when, when we started working with her, I said, is that even a thing? People yeah. buy, people buy hamster beds. Never heard of it. Yeah. She made a killing selling wow. hamster beds. You know, one of my other clients is big into pets. So they've got a, you know, an organic, chemical free pet cleaner company. You know, one of my other clients is, is really into like cryptocurrency. So they ended up getting launching an accredited university for cryptocurrencies, right? None of these things have anything in, in common at all. Mm -hmm. Right. I actually have found that I prefer to be the person that looks at the business because I know all the mechanics that have to happen to make it successful. Mm -hmm. And I like being the person that comes in and plugs the holes and adds the things in that can make it more profitable and pulls the levers and, and, and makes it go from where it's at to two or three times bigger because I've been in that space now for 15 years. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm passionate about. I don't, I'm not really that passionate about, you know, creating my own offer, you know, per se that's, mm -hmm. I've done that a million times and it's kind of got burnt out on it. So, I, so that's why I do what I do. We have our ad agency, and I do my, co my coaching and my consulting because I get to work on all these different interesting projects mm -hmm. that all essentially have the same frameworks of how to be successful, but they're driven by people who are really passionate about that thing, right? So that's what, that's what gives me the energy to, to wake up. I like talking to people. I like hearing their ideas. I like formulating the plan that allows them to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. So just closing the loop on it, you know, if you hate doing what you're doing, you won't, you won't make any money at it. You won't, no matter how many success stories you see, you will not make any money at it. If you wake up and you get excited, you have a significantly better chance to mm -hmm. be successful because you're drawing from that resource. So I would say, you know, first and foremost, be passionate about where you're going with what you're going. And secondly, you know, do as much research as you can on the people who are winning in your space, right? Because they're going to cut down the learning curve for you on what it takes to be successful. I'm not saying copy them. What I'm saying is, is, is cut down on the learning curve and the mistakes because those, those cost time and money, right? Mm -hmm. take, take, you know, the model, the frameworks that are working for them, and then add your own creative twist to it, your own unique selling proposition. And you can cut down the launch of a business from five years to, to one year, 
right? And then as you grow, and this is just something that I've had to learn for a long time, you know, we become control freaks and we, we want to do everything, you know, because we think that nobody can do it any better than us. And again, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the end of the movie. I'll spoil the end of the movie for you. Um, first off, there's lots of people who can do things better than you. And secondly, um, if you hold the control on it and you don't leverage time and, and resources of other really, really successful people, you're going to cap out every single time. You know, mm -hmm. it should always be, how can I add almost like when we get a software and we find a software that's like, that saves us time for, you know, whatever reporting or posting, or you know, we find, and we go, Oh, this is the greatest thing ever. It just gave me all this more time. Right. Humans who are amazing at their skill set will do 10 times, you know, what that, that software piece is, mm -hmm. which allows us to then focus on where are we most efficient and effective? I'm most efficient and effective at talking to people, pulling out of them what they really want, analyzing what they're doing, you know, modifying their direction, saving them time, saving them money, you know, increasing growth, you know, selling people on the strategy and the idea. That's where I'm the most effective. I'm not the most effective in actually fulfilling the stuff. Can I? Sure. I've bought a hundred million dollars worth of media online. I can buy mm -hmm. media, but buying media takes time. Mm -hmm. It takes away from over here, right? I can, I can, I can program. Am I a good programmer? No. Mm -hmm. Right. Should I be programming? No. Right. Because a, a programmer out of, you know, India will cost me $30 an hour and I'm trying to make $2,000 an hour. Right. So, you know, I, you gotta, you gotta look every time your business grows of where you can fill those inefficiencies with tools or people and keep focused on the main thing, keep the main thing, the main thing, right? Whatever you're great at, keep the main thing, the main thing and find a way to fill those holes so that you don't waste your time on stuff that can be done by people who are better than you at it and probably significantly cheaper. Exactly. Yeah. I like that. And, uh, oh yeah. I was going to grab the book. I started reading this one. Oh, Dean nice. Has I haven't read that one yet by, by Dean. You know, our, our agency used to actually run Dean's traffic. I haven't read that book. Have you started reading it yet? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, how, how is it? I'm getting there. Uh, yeah, nice. But one of the things that he's saying is that we've been taught, right? At school, etc. Whatever you're shitty at is what you have to work on most. And Dean says, and that that's basically what I got from you as a message is like, that's just dumb. That's going to cost you tons of time, tons of money, um, et cetera, et cetera. No, what you do is you focus, you, you focus on what you say, like the main thing is the main thing. So there's your strengths, right? That's what I got from you. And your weaknesses, you find somebody else. That way your weaknesses are their main thing. So they can focus on their main thing, meaning your weaknesses. And that way you can explode, right? Absolutely. That's what it's so, efficiency. It's, it's leverage, yeah. right? And, and people, I think people sometimes beat themselves up over their weaknesses and they're like, oh man, I got to get better at that. Exactly. Well, but we all have different personality types and I've read a lot of different books on personality types. Sometimes it's just not your personality type. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got scientists and, 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 you know, those types of personalities, they're analytical personalities, right? That's the right person to be looking at my finances and my data and, you know, my systems, mm -hmm. right? That's those personalities. You know, you've got other personalities that are like the salesperson, the, the party starter, you know, the, the, the communicator, the engager, the, you know, the visionary. That's a different type of personality, mm -hmm. right? You've got, you know, like your school teachers and your, you know, community workers and your government workers. They're more like support, empathy, you know, type personalities. You want to yeah. know, you, you want to know like the fastest way to like, turn off one of those personalities is ask them for a credit card, right? Mm -hmm. Cause they're not driven by money. They're not, they're not driven by financial motivation. That's why they do those types of jobs. 
Mm-hmm. Right. So if you take that person and you try to put them in a sales role, like, and get them to be closing sales in their own business, they're going to fail miserably mm-hmm. because it's not their personality makeup in the same way that, you know, I put people in charge of systems, my COO and my CFO, cause I'm that guy that'll just keep taking clients all day long, not considering at all, like the, the actual fulfillment side and the actual like mechanics and finances. And, and so I have to say to them, Hey, like, what's the budget for this? Do we have the bandwidth for it? What's the schedule? Mm-hmm. I don't even know my login to my own bank account. You know, I, I, I'm that guy that's just, he's, I'm going right. I'm, I'm more in the like creative sales, mm-hmm. you know, that personality. So to, to, to tell people, Oh, you've got to like, you've got to be excellent at this one thing. It just, it, it's probably not their personality type and they're probably never going to be amazing at it. So you're just wasting time and money trying mm-hmm. to become that person. Exactly. So since we're talking about this, because I've noticed as well, um, and Russell actually is also very big about this in regards to, you know, find people, leverage. Um, and now I'm following these guys that are in that point of, okay, I need to leverage, I need to leverage because I keep hearing it, me included. And I'm watching these guys and they're like, man, I thought I'd find the perfect person and it's absolute bust, right? So I'm asking, is that part of, okay, that's just part of failure and you learn the lesson and you keep growing, you find the right one? Or is it just them, me included, not knowing the process of finding that person that can fill in that spot? Like what's, what's that system for that? I mean, for, for me, you know, one, I don't do the interviews. Mm-hmm. And, and the reason why I don't do the interviews is because I'm, my personality type is, is to engage and sell and inspire mm-hmm. and whatever. So it's, it, it, if anybody feeds me that loop back, then I'm instantly like, this is a great person. Yeah, this, yeah. this is a person for the job. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because that's my nature where like my operations manager will go in and he'll say, show me your experience. Show me some sample projects. We're going to bring you on for two hours. We're going to test out the quality of your work. You know, where I'll be that guy that's, if they're like, man, I've done this and this and this and this. And I'm like, this is a cool guy. I'll just hire him. Right. So first and foremost, you know, the hiring side needs to be separated from the, the, the personal side. And, and you really need to do a lot of due diligence and you really need to make people earn your trust. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you, the, you know, the, the easiest way to sort of cut that down is to ask for referrals from, you know, people that you trust in their networks. So if they trust them, obviously there's a little bit of credibility built in there, but then you need to really get uncomfortable by asking for a lot of data as to why they should prove themselves and, and, and get them to do, you know, trial runs with you and not over commit to those people in the beginning, really make them earn it. Cause they're not your friends. They're your employees. Mm-hmm. And, and then, you know, ultimately you also need to look at your expectations. You need to set high expectations for them. But, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk said it best. If you think that anybody's going to work as hard as you are, then you're delusional because you're the owner and they're the employee. If you can find somebody that cares about your business, even 60% as much as you do, that's a miracle. And you should give that person a raise and keep them forever. So, you know, Mm -hmm. our expectations of what we think should happen versus reality need to be adjusted a little bit. And and we need to slow it down when we're trying to find that right person and, and really make them prove themselves to us and, and, and do trial runs and, and move them up slowly, you know, because it takes a lot of time to hire somebody, train them, fire them, you know, find somebody else, train them, fire them. But that being said, you know, Tony Robbins said he didn't make it from his first phase of growth to a second phase of growth until he realized I have to fire people as quickly as possible. So as long as you've got those processes in place of vetting them and getting what you think is the right person, if they then don't meet your expectations, you've got to be willing to be like, nope, it's not the right person. You know, he had a lot of friends and family working for him in the beginning and he got him to a certain level, but then they really weren't that talented. Like, 
they didn't have enough experience to take it the business to the next level. And, and ultimately he had to let them all go and he had to bring in really talented people to go to that next level. Right. Yeah. So, you know, every time I have to do something three times, I send it to my operations manager and I say, find a way to systemize this mm -hmm. either with a software or with one of our employees or whatever, because if I'm doing something more than three times, that's a waste of my time, mm -hmm. right? That's taking away from the main thing. Exactly. Yep. Makes sense. Um, like you're talking about actually hiring a person like, like being in your company, right? Yeah. And I've noticed that, and so I'm now I'm just asking for your opinion what you think about this because um, what I'm focused like I'm a dappener and at the moment it's just me right so and I see a lot of other dappeners out there that are just starting out and their first step for leveraging is get a virtual assistant right sure yeah absolutely just share real quick from because you're hiring actually like okay this guy's on the payroll what what what's your view on that what would you say yes it's absolutely more safe to first start off with a virtual assistant or if you were absolutely to a, 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 a virtual assistant is definitely that first hire mm. where where most people screw it up is they go hire somebody and then they try to dump all of the information on them that they want them to do mm -hmm. right where if you want to have a good experience with a virtual assistant take the next month and every time you do a task video record it every single one and nobody wants to do that because it's work mm -hmm. right and, and, it, and it, they just want to get stuff done mm -hmm. but you know for me it would be every time i launched an ad campaign every time i had to ask for a, a social media video to be edited Every time I had to do up a contract, every time I had to do up a proposal, every time I had to bill somebody, every time I had to, every time I had to do anything, I videoed it, I screen captured it with a video and I put it into a file, right? And after I did that for a month, I then went out and I, and I put up, um, uh, I put out requests for a VA. I did some on Upwork. I did some, which you can find some great people. Um, I, I did, I asked for referrals from friends and family. I got some great referrals. I ended up hiring a friend of the family. Um, and I said to her, this is all the stuff I'm currently doing. I want you to go through all the videos and I want you to systemize the processes and start to take them off of my plate one by one. And every time you think you can take it off my plate, let me know if you have any questions about the videos that maybe I missed specifics, let me know. And it's got to the point now where uh, I've done that with every staff member and, and, and they just know what to do. They mm -hmm. have those policy policies and procedures in place. So when I say, look, I need a contract done for this and it's going to include this, this, and this, and I need a, a, an outline done like a scope of work. And I need to, you know, I need you to bid it out for me and I need you to find the vendors that we're going to use to facilitate this. And what I'm selling it, I'm strategizing what we're going to need. I'm handing it off and they're taking it from there. Mm -hmm. Right. So now I'm only meeting once a week to look at the progress of things and see how they're working and see if I'm seeing something that they're missing that we can move the needle a little bit. But as far as the actual mechanics of doing all that stuff, I'm not doing that stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Even my daughter said last night, can I work for you? I want to make some more money. You know, she's 15. And, uh, and I said, sure, you can, you could work for me. I'm sure there's things that you could do, but understand you don't work for me. You work for them. Right. You know, you work for my operations manager and my customer service manager, and you can talk to me about whatever you want. Cause we're in the house, but you don't report to me. And, and very rarely will I report to you. <laughs> there's systems in place, you know, to, to make it run smoothly. Exactly. Exactly. So would you say that's one of the biggest success or one of the big successes of a business to make sure that you, you start building and working on your systems as soon as possible? Yeah. Anything like if you want to do an experiment again, keep a piece of paper by your desk for a week and 
just start like the easiest way to do it is actually to write down, you know, every time you do something and it's hard to do it first because you're busy and you don't want to write it down. <laughs> but, you know, you start off the day with um, wrote emails, right? And wrote an email to this person, wrote an email to this person, wrote an email to this person. And then it was, you know, um, you know, got on prospecting calls or, you know, whatever, you just every single thing that you do, you know, how, like for you, it's going to be like, edit this podcast or, you know, mm. whatever, or you you sent me like five reminders for this podcast. Cause I'm sure people don't show up all the time, you know, and you got to like hammer them with reminders cause they're busy. Well, how many times have you done all of the, the processes of getting somebody to a, a podcast and all the communications and all the things, right? As soon as you start seeing a pattern where you've done them more than three times, right? Or you, you've done it, it, it's becoming repetitive. Mm. It's about figuring out how to put those in somebody else's hands because how much time are you taking away from selling what you need to sell? Because the only thing that matters, you know, in, in the business is, is building its revenue and pleasing its customers, right? That's where, that's where the focus needs to be for probably for you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. That's great advice. It's actually on my calendar for doing. So that's kind of funny that you mentioned that. <laughs> uh, yep. Um, so anyway, that's great, man. That's great advice. And I hope that happens pick up on that because in the beginning, it's just, yeah, it's, it's hard. You want to make that first step. And as you said, you, you, you hit that plateau, right? You hit that, like, shoot, I only have that amount of time, especially if you just got newborns and stuff like that. It's like, man, and you got to spend time on that as well. Absolutely. This, this is absolutely fantastic advice. I have one friend of mine who had a, who has a VA right now. He just started out and he's just raving about it. It's like, this is oh. amazing. <laughs> I, I just brought on a new COO and, and I can't stop bragging about him in my house, you know, to my wife. I'm like, this guy's doing everything. He's got everything under control, you know, nothing slipping through the cracks, you know, which gives me the confidence to go out. I have a, a wait list right now of, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, of 16 clients that right. want to come on. Right. I don't feel comfortable bringing those clients on if I can't fulfill mm -hmm. what I'm offering. Exactly. Right. So by having him knowing that he's got everything organized and everything's being taken care of, it's, it allows me the confidence to pick up the phone, create that new conversation see, you know, if it's a right fit and bring them into the fold where otherwise I would say, no, I would just say, no, I'd say we're maxed out right now mm -hmm. in our bandwidth. Exactly, exactly. That's awesome. So yeah, I really appreciate we talking about this, Aaron. Um, man, time flies. We're almost at the end. Right? I, still, yeah. I still have, I was going to say shit load of questions, which I do, but I just didn't want to say shit. But anyway, it's out now. Yeah, I still got shit loads of questions. I want to ask this because it's one of the things that I've noticed also that a lot of even entrepreneurs and dappers that are, are starting out are making a big mistake. And that has up my game is getting a coach, right? Yeah. One when I, I started out, which has really up my game. And I now I got a new one, which, man, I, I can't thank him enough. I'm paying in and I'm thinking it was like, what? Right. <laughs> it's so fantastic right so i'm i just want to hear because i always if i get the opportunity i always ask right because there's so many out there that don't get a coach and i was that person i just can't wrap my head around it now it's like why are you not getting a coach so can you share as much as possible in the five minutes that we have left about a coach why should somebody get a coach how could maybe it's even more important how could somebody find the right coach for them in the beginning? Yeah. I mean, I think that, that, that going back to sort of the original part of the conversation is, is you got to find a coach who specializes in your area. And mm -hmm. you know, probably the easiest way to accomplish that is to, is through social media. There's so many groups out there now where you can ask for referrals and people are happy to refer. And as long as you're specific about your area, your niche, your company, um, they're going to refer you to people. And then obviously, you know, it has to meet your budget, right? Having a great coach is, is an awesome thing. 
Um, it will save you a ton of money, but if it leaves you with no money, then that's self-destructive, right? So you've got to be you've got to be interviewing these people, right? So you know you, you get a list of referrals of a bunch of different people. You've got to call them and interview. You got to really grill them. You know, the when I first got started in the industry, um, in in my own you know uh, entrepreneurial journey, I used to think lawyers were like this like super important, you know, thing, for example. So like if I got a letter from a lawyer or something, I would like freak out, like, like, they, like they worked for the government or something, you know? And, and when I hired a lawyer, it was, it was, do you think you could, you know, do you mind? Cause you always have legal issues come up when you have business, you know, copyright or this or that or whatever, mm. could you help me? And they would take advantage of me at $500 an hour you know, running me around on conversations and suggesting stupid shit. Right. And then one day, you know, after you have enough of those experiences, you realize that's just a vendor. He's just a, an employee, like everybody else trying to get paid. And all of a sudden my conversations were like, you will do this and this and this in this time frame, And I will pay you this amount and either you will do it or you will not do it. Right. Because I had brought them down off that pedestal. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you're interviewing a coach, it's got to be like, look, I want to accomplish this and this and this and this. Tell me your experience and why you're the right person for me for this and this and this. And if they can't sell you on that, then they're not the right person. And it's okay because they're just, they're, in a, they're essentially in a, 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 it's a weird dynamic because they're coaching you, but they're an employee. You pay them. Mm -hmm. right? So they have to be able to check the boxes that you want. And yes, it's very, very important to have a great coach in your industry who's had the results that you want who's got clients that have the results that you want, um, it will cut down tremendously on your, your learning curve, which will, will save you money, you know, saves you money and time. Um, I keep going to different coaches because I keep going to different levels, mm -hmm. right? Of you course. know, it's, you, you know, you, I, got, I remember I did a drop ship store last year. It did 8 million in sales. Mm -hmm. And you know, I went out to the coaching community and said, is anybody doing, can I get a coach who's doing more than 8 million in drop shipping sales? And everybody said, are you insane? There is nobody doing 8 million and you're the only person doing 8 million in drop. Okay. Right. And eventually I worked my way up and I, I found my way to somebody who was doing a hundred million. Right. Mm -hmm. So now that was the person that, that I wanted to pick their brain. And sometimes one-on-one -on -one coaching is, is not ideal. It's not, it's too expensive or, whatever. There's a lot of mastermind groups with multiple people in it led by one coach where you can leverage the experience of 5, 10, 15, 25 people, right? At potentially a lower cost. You know, I'm part of Ezra Firestone's group, which is an e-commerce um, group. Ezra Firestone does, you know, about 50 million a year in e-com. Mm -hmm. And that costs me $1,200, you know, a month. And I get access to his stuff and all the other members where, you know, a really, really good e-com coach might be $10,000 a month, right? So for me, I feel like I get more value from that because I can pop in and pop out. It works for me right now. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I got lucky that my coach that I'm working with now, like the first one I got through, like you say, right? I was asking like, hey, I'm looking for somebody and I got through him. The coach that I have now, like he helped me just... Like I saw him on Facebook and he started helping me. Like I had a question. He just really wanted to help me. Yeah. And at some point after two months of just helping me and me seeing like, oh, wow, 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 wow. Next step, next step. I'm like, dude, I got to work with you. Well, how do we okay. say And then we make it work for he Like he's even making it work for me for the summer. That's all. Awesome. So I was like, wow. And that's what I'm trying to do, right? I'm doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. And uh, yeah, just like you said, making it work for, for my clients. And, and everybody's different, man. Everybody's got different needs. Everybody's got different time frames. Everybody's got different budgets. Exactly. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I really appreciate you sharing that. I think it's very important. Like besides saying like, look, I'm a coach, right. And you should come work with me. It's like, no, for me, like it, it kind of becomes also a mission. Like dude, everybody just needs a coach. You don't have to work with me. If I fit great, if I don't, please find somebody because I see the benefits right you you just shared about the benefits it's like boom you got to get that next step and you cut you're cutting so hard the corners the the, the time everything years sometimes right 
Well, your, your competitors aren't going to tell you. So who's going to tell you? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Man, it's an hour. I really appreciate it. I'm going to show again for the people uh, before we, we disconnect. Um, the website is in the comment section. You just can click on the link and get to the website right away. Check them out. Um, you mentioned, but mention it real quick. What are the best ways to connect with you if, like me, <laughs> there's a lot of the entrepreneurs listening right now and they're like, dude, man, you talk so much, but I got more questions about this certain topic or whatever it is, right? They can, um, they can message me through Facebook. They can drop an email to me through my site, AaronParkinson.com. Um, shoot, they can send me an email to Aaron at AaronParkinson.com. I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty open book, so. Awesome. I appreciate it. And I saw you on Instagram, so I'll make sure for the people that are listening to the recording or watching the recording on YouTube, uh, I'll make sure that I put the links in the description so you can just click on it and check it out right away as well. So well, thanks for having me on the hundredth show. Congratulations. That's commitment. Thank you. I appreciate commitment. it. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. I had some crazy, insane people like you on the show. That, um, yeah, man. So it's been uh, so far. It's been amazing. So I'm enjoying the journey, but I got to cut it down. Like sometimes I was doing eight lives in a week. Wow. Um, and that's not even as much as I've seen other people do. Yeah, I think Gary Vaynerchuk did like, he did like 365 days in a row or something for Wine Library. He was a savage. Yeah, exactly. And it takes away so much time for everything else. And I'm growing and I'm getting more clients. And I'm like, I want more clients as well. And so it's building structure. Building all you have to do is keep doing this and keep fulfilling the clients and get all the other stuff exactly. off, your, off your table. Yep. That's the, that's the plan. But for now I'm going, I'm going, I'm downsizing my live interviews to one a week, the same day, same time. So everybody knows like, okay, this now is going to get live. Now, now he's going to get an amazing dappener on the show that he's going to pick his brain as much as he can and share all the golden nuggets possible. So Aaron, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being the hundredth. Um, man, you over delivered. Uh, um, if, yeah, absolutely. So I really appreciate your golden nuggets that you shared. Everybody that's been with us now live or later listening to the recording. Uh, thank you so much for being on this journey for hundred live interviews. I appreciate you. And we'll go live again tomorrow. It looks the same, but it'll be different. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. I appreciate every one of you. I'm grateful grateful for all of you and I wish you a fantastic rest of the day. Take care. Thanks for having me. Are you still meeting up with your friends now that you're a father? Kids making you stress out, you got no time for yourself to work out, read, relax. Can you still remember the time you were hanging out with your friends feeling energetic, happy and confident? Spending time together and talking about your life and your crazy dreams. You're feeling alone now, don't you? No one to share your challenges with and you're just running around from one storm into the next. Well, it's time to change this now. Join me and the Brotherhood of Fearless Fathers to speak on a weekly basis with like-minded dads to crush your challenges, face your fears with determination, be held accountable and regain control of your life. If you want to become the hero your family needs you to be, then go to becomeafearlessfather.com slash brotherhood. Looking forward to seeing you on one of our next calls.